Deadly shooting near a busy shopping mall in El Paso, Texas. More mass shootings so far this year than days. Deadliest shooting in U.S. history. At least 18 people. 14 students. 10 people shot dead. 15 people are believed to have died. At least 14 dead. 33 dead, 29 wounded. At least 17 people have been killed. 80 people were killed or wounded in two evil attacks. This only happens in this country. Just kept going and going and my husband said, that's not firecrackers, that sounds like a semiotic rifle. They were shooting anyone of color wearing a white hat or played a sport. <laughs> but I don't know where my son is. No one can tell me where my son is. The majority of those who died today were children. Uh, beautiful little kids between the ages of 5 and 10 years old. There's only so many times you can walk into a room and tell someone they're not coming home tomorrow. Mass shootings in the United States have been on the rise in the past 20 years. It's been way too many. According to the Gun Violence Archive, this year alone, there's been 199 mass shootings, and it's only May. That's more than one a day. I was just about to sit down to record this video when I learned about two more that happened today. One at a mall in Dallas, Texas, and one at a party near California State University, Chico. I know that there will be more incidents between when I record this video and when it gets posted online. So uh, I guess I'll put all the new incidents here. I don't know about you, but every time I hear about yet another mass shooting, I'm shocked and, and horrified. But at this point, I'm not surprised. It's become far too normal in America for things like this to happen. And these incidents have a huge impact on our lives and well-being. They threaten our communities and haunt our minds because suddenly anywhere, like a grocery store or a movie theater or a church or a synagogue or a parking lot or a Sweet 16 party or a mall or a school can become the epicenter of unspeakable violence. Who would do such a thing? What drives a person to decide to kill a lot of people. We're going to dive into the mind of a mass shooter to see what inspires these terrible actions. It's not gonna be pretty, but it will reveal the warning signs that could be used to stop these kinds of tragedies from happening in the future. Our thoughts and prayers are not enough. This is just absolutely pure evil. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. To understand the mind of a mass shooter, we first need a profile of who we're talking about. Of course, every individual and incident is different, but from a population standpoint, there are patterns of behaviors or characteristics that we can analyze to draw some conclusions about their personality, psychology, and motives. Much of the information that I'll be sharing comes from the FBI and the Violence Project, which is a government-funded nonprofit organization that um, has compiled a lot of information regarding every mass shooting in the U.S. since 1966. So, here's some stats. 97% of all mass shooters are men. The average age of a mass shooter is between about 32 and 34. Shooters at schools or college campuses are typically younger in their 20s, while shooters at places of worship or workplaces tend to be older, like in their 40s. 53% of all mass shooters are white, 20% are black, 8% are Latinx, 6% are Asian, 4% are Middle Eastern, and 2% are Native American. Those demographics shift depending on the location. Shooters at K through 12 schools or places of worship or stores or restaurants are more likely to be white, while shooters on college campuses are more likely to be Asian. And workplace shootings have a more mixed racial profile. 80% of mass shooters experience an identifiable personal crisis prior to the shooting. 
Most often that's linked to severe and acute life stressors, and they tend to exhibit multiple signs or certain behavioral changes, including increased agitation, abusive behavior, and isolation. 70% of mass shooters know at least some of their victims. 54% have a history of perpetuating domestic violence and abuse. 56% of active shooters share their intent to commit violence in some way ahead of time. 28% have a military background. About 70% of mass shooters are known to be suicidal and view their mass shooting as a final act or blaze of glory that's intended to end in their death. Around 60% die on the scene of the shooting. Hearing all of this information, we start to get a picture of the demographics and life circumstances of a mass shooter. But you know what hasn't come up yet? Mental illness. Horrifying mass shootings that have been linked to mental illness. I think that uh, mental health is your problem here. How do we make sure that individuals with mental illness do not touch a gun? I think ultimately, I think what this does is highlight uh, some of the mental health issues, the mental health crisis we have in this country. We've got to have a severe conversation here with this country. We've got to deal with mental illness. Did you know that he was sick? No, I, I just thought he was a disillusioned aloof, shy young man that needed as much love as we could give. And he, you know, he wasn't easy. Because he would suck the oxygen out of the room. Turn on any channel or read any news article in the wake of one of these violent incidents, and mental illness will inevitably come up, whether it's politicians. But this is also a mental illness problem. If you look at both of these cases, this is mental illness. Reporters. Possibly investigators say PTSD, that's what they're looking at, but he had a history of problems. Community members. Evidence that the shooter was suffering with a mental illness was identified. Everyone instinctually fixes their gaze on this one factor to try to make sense of these senseless acts. But here's the thing. Mental illness does not cause mass shootings. And in fact, most mass shooters are not mentally ill. I can hear the comments rolling in already, so let's put some nuance to this admittedly provocative stance. There is an assumption that I think a lot of people make about mass shooters. That assumption is that if you're willing to go and kill a bunch of people, then you must be crazy or deranged or not all there because someone who's in full control of their mental faculties wouldn't do something that evil, right? So many of these deranged killers have a long and horrifying descent into mental illness before they commit their crime. I wonder if the psychologists you talk to have ever said that evil itself is a psychological disorder. Anybody who shoots somebody else has a mental health challenge, period. No. Obviously wrong. There's so many examples of people killing lots of other people for very clear reasons. I live in Chicago, which is often called the homicide capital of the country because there's a high amount of public violence between gang members and a lot of people die. Do people ever look at those people, those shootings, and say, ah, oh, you know, this is just a sad case of someone with mental illness crying out for help? No, they're often denigrated and called violent thugs or gangbangers who grew up in the bad part of town. It's like the purpose is just to be part of a gang and to engage in this violence for the sake of what exactly? In reality, to the people who commit these crimes, their shootings have a clear purpose. These individuals are killing for respect or revenge or to protect territory. It's a competition for dominance. They're attempting to establish a social order that they believe is correct for some reason or another. Is that motivated by mental illness? No. The Ku Klux Klan sure committed a lot of mass killings of black Americans in the name of white supremacy. There's over 4,000 documented cases of murder by the group. I don't think anyone would seriously attribute those actions to mental illness. Of course, there's Plenty of examples of people killing many individuals due to love triangles or 
because an argument becomes violent or because it's part of another crime like a bank robbery. We don't typically excuse away that behavior as mental illness if someone has been to a psychiatric hospital before. And after 9-11, we saw an increase in mass shootings committed by Islamic extremists in the US. Do we ever look at those people and say, maybe this could have been prevented if they'd gotten proper mental health treatment? No, we chalk it up to terrorism, talk about how the person was inspired by or connected to other terrorist groups, and we move on. The massacre in San Bernardino was an act of foreign-inspired terrorism. The truth is that you can be completely sane and still engage in gruesomely violent acts. But you might look at those examples and say, well, yeah, but these mass shooters are different. You know, the ones that shoot up elementary schools or Walmarts or nightclubs. The narrative that we hear is that these folks are lone wolves whose actions seem impulsive and random. That kind of disorganized behavior and directionless aggression could only come from someone with a mental illness, right? Well, listen, I work with people every day who are diagnosed with mental illnesses. They've got depression, social anxiety, OCD, PTSD, eating disorders, you name it. And I work with a lot of other therapists who also see lots of clients with mental illnesses. Want to know how many of them are aggressive and dangerous to others? Pretty much none. Almost everyone knows someone with a mental illness, a friend, a coworker, a family member. It's a medical issue caused by a lot of different factors that could affect literally anyone. My wife, Allie, has a mental illness. She's talked about it before on this channel. You might have a mental illness, just like 45 million other Americans. That's more than one in five American adults living with a mental illness of some kind. Given how big of a group that is, it's pretty upsetting and also kind of absurd to see people make stigmatizing statements like, people with mental illnesses are dangerous. But of course, when mental illness comes up in the context of mass shootings, our minds don't usually go to the people who we know. Now, it goes to the homeless guy who's yelling at cars passing by, or the person who's involuntarily hospitalized because they had a psychotic episode, or the kind of person who you cross the street to avoid. We focus on a small minority of people that are seriously mentally ill, like folks with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Is there any basis for this? Well, when we look at the data, evidence shows that people with mental illnesses overall are no more likely to perpetrate violence compared to the general population. However, there is data that shows that people with severe mental illnesses like major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and schizoaffective disorder are slightly more likely to commit acts of violence. About 0.8 of the general public commits violent acts in a four-year period, while 2.9% of people with serious mental illnesses do in that same amount of time. That percentage is almost four times as high, but it also shows that most people with severe mental illnesses are overwhelmingly not violent. The likelihood that you will be killed by someone with schizophrenia is only one in 144,000. So you're actually 13 times more likely to die in a mass shooting than by someone with schizophrenia, at least if you're an American. Given how small those numbers are, we can perhaps say that there is a correlation between serious mental illness and violence, but not causation. Symptoms like long-standing paranoia or command hallucinations or delusions of grandeur or antisocial tendencies might contribute to violent behavior, but it's just as likely that this increase in violence and of the person's symptoms are caused by external life factors that are also known to increase the potential for committing violent acts, which also happen to affect people with serious mental illnesses at much higher rates. These include things like not having a job or a home or stable income, being alienated or isolated from loved ones or the community, having an addiction, or being the victim of violence. And that last one is a well-studied fact. People with mental illnesses are far more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators. 
Men who are diagnosed with a mental illness are 76% more likely to be the victim of a violent crime than those who have not been diagnosed. And women with mental illnesses are 300% more at risk. The truth is that less than 5% of violent crimes are committed by people with severe mental illness. That's not negligible, but it pales in comparison to the 95% of violent crime committed by everybody else. Now, I'm not trying to convince you that mental illness never plays a role in mass shootings. I imagine that some of you might point to the University of Texas Tower Shooter of 1966, who left a suicide note asking for an autopsy because he was experiencing unusual and irrational thoughts. The autopsy revealed a small tumor that might have affected his ability to control his thoughts and emotions. But also, a commission of scientists stated that the relationship between the brain tumor and his actions could not be established with clarity. Regardless, one study found that symptoms of psychosis, which include delusions, hallucinations, and cognitive symptoms like being confused, disturbed, or having disrupted thought patterns, were more common among mass shooters than the general population, and likely played a major role in about 10.5% of mass shootings. These are the kinds of individuals who might qualify for the insanity defense, which is the standard used in the American legal system to decide whether a person should not be held responsible for their crimes because they were legally insane at the time that the crime was committed. The insanity defense is pretty difficult to argue without sufficient evidence that the person didn't understand the nature of their actions. Only 1% of criminal cases attempt to use it, and only 26% of those are successful. And looking at past cases, it is very uncommon for mass shooters to successfully claim the insanity defense. But I will concede that there are some outliers where mental illness plays a role in influencing a person's actions. Some. But this conclusion leads us to an uncomfortable truth, which is that all but a few mass shootings were not the consequence of mental illness. So, why would a sane person commit such an act? Lone actors are continuing to plan and carry out devastating attacks. Police say he was motivated by racist hatred and white supremacist views. The shooter had a patch on his clothing that said RWDS. They believe that stands for right wing death squad. Potential ties to neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups. There was simply no reasonable explanation or excuse, they said, for what he did. This is an individual who was described as a lone wolf. I don't know how it could have been prevented. Remember earlier how I referred to the media narrative that these shooters are lone wolves whose reckless violence seemed disorganized and impulsive and random? Well, it turns out that that's not true at all. In most cases, these shootings are planned in advance, directed at someone or something specific, and carried out deliberately. The Columbine shooters started planning their shooting spree a year in advance as an act of revenge against other students and teachers who they'd felt had wronged them. The Las Vegas shooter, the deadliest mass shooter in American history, had a year-long buying spree of firearms and ammunition he carefully researched police tactics and response, and he scoped out the area multiple times to figure out how to inflict the most damage. The Buffalo Shooter's ideas and methods were nurtured through toxic online communities. He wrote down detailed notes and plans for months on Discord, and sections of his manifesto were directly lifted from the Christchurch Shooter's writings. These people knew what they were doing and they made a conscious choice to act. You wanna know why people commit heinous crimes like these? We know the motives. They include employment issues, interpersonal conflicts, relationship issues, legal issues, economic issues, racism or xenophobia, fame seeking, religious hate, misogyny, homophobia. When you boil it down, people commit mass shootings for two general reasons, because of a personal grievance or because of radical ideology, sometimes both. 
If you want to understand the mental state of someone who commits a mass shooting, almost all of them experience deep feelings of anger or self-loathing that develop into externalized hate, resentment, and blame that drive these violent actions. This partially explains why mental illness gets dragged into these conversations. I think that a lot of politicians and media outlets and community members use it as an easy scapegoat so that we don't have to talk about the real difficult societal issues that perpetuate these crimes. Which issues, I hear you ask? Well, how about the rise of extremism in our country? Over the last 10 years, Domestic terrorism incidents in the United States have increased by 357%. According to the Government Accountability Office and the Anti-Defamation League, 75% of domestic extremist-related killings over the past 10 years have been perpetuated by right-wing extremists, which include white supremacy, toxic masculinity, and anti-abortion extremists. 20% have been perpetuated by domestic Islamic extremists, and 4% have been perpetuated by left-wing extremists, which include anarchists and black nationalists. That's pretty wild that far-right extremists are killing more than three times as many people as domestic Islamic extremists. That means that, statistically speaking, terrorists in America look like young white men. Now, I know that that might upset a lot of people watching this video right now. Race and politics are sensitive topics, but know that I'm not trying to attack any one person or group. I really just want to have an open and honest conversation about these real issues without getting defensive and throwing up walls. I know that that might still happen, but I wanted to say it anyway. Mass shooters often study other shooters or are part of radical groups online that validate promote, and celebrate violence. This might include sites like 4chan, 8chan, or Telegram, or even platforms that you've used, like Reddit, Discord, or Facebook. They might watch OAN, or Newsmax, or white nationalist YouTuber Nick Fuentes, or any number of other figures that promote hateful or dangerous ideas, such as false flags, or the Great Replacement Theory or the QAnon conspiracy. These theories, which are completely unsupported by any evidence, can encourage those feelings of fear, anger, and an us versus them mentality that can play such a large role in motivating extremist shooters. When you see the commonalities between many of these radicalized individuals, they end up looking more like inspired followers than lone wolves. Another major issue is the accessibility to firearms. Guns are efficient and effective weapons for committing mass violence. They result in higher numbers of fatalities compared to other weapons like knives or even explosives. When guns are readily available, committing mass shootings are easier to do. It's as simple as that. The United States is the country with the most civilian held firearms. We're less than 5% of the world's population, but we account for 46% of global civilian gun ownership. It's estimated that there's 393 million guns in circulation in America. That's an average of 1.2 guns per person. The country with the next highest level of gun ownership is Yemen with 0.5 guns per person. As of 2019, the U.S. accounts for 73% of mass shootings. Among mass shooters, 77% of them purchased at least some of their guns legally. And for school shootings, over 80% of mass shooters stole guns from family members. It's clear that if you have reduced access to guns, then mass shootings become less common. And of course, easy access to guns is the logical outcome of our country's loose gun control laws. I mean, regardless of your feelings about gun ownership, poor gun control plays a big role here. I mean, unlike car ownership, for example, there's no federal requirements to take a safety exam or 
get a license or have insurance. Despite the dangers of owning a gun, it's something that you can buy and legally own the same day. Just be 18 or older, fill out a form, and pass an instant background check. We can observe the effects of loosened gun control in action. I mean, when the federal assault weapons ban went into place in 1994, it limited the sale of certain kinds of weapons and banned high capacity magazines. Mass shootings fell by 37%. But when the ban lapsed in 2004, there was a 183% increase in mass shootings and a 239% increase in mass shooting deaths. Today, even within the country, research shows that higher rates of mass shootings occur in states with more relaxed gun control laws. Again, the easier access you have to guns, the easier it is to act upon violent thoughts. And this doesn't even get into the conversation about gun violence generally. Mass shootings make up a, a tiny percentage of gun violence, as in like 1% or less. Suicides actually account for the majority of US gun deaths at around 54%. To be honest, while mass shootings get a lot more media coverage and have higher public interest, I probably should have made this video about gun violence and suicide because the United States has an embarrassingly high rate of suicide by gun. Like, it's an epidemic. In any case, it's been the trend among conservative politicians and media to distract from issues around guns and right-wing ideology, in part because they implicate the kinds of policies and rhetoric that modern conservatism tends to promote. This includes gun ownership, anti-government sentiments, devaluing racial minorities or LGBTQ plus members, and prioritizing Christian dogma. So rather than engaging in honest self-reflection, we end up pointing our fingers and say, look at the weird bad people. Whatever can we do? Ugh. You can't fix crazy. Thoughts and prayers. There's no way to prevent this, says only nation where this regularly happens. There are 19 sets of parents who, who are never going to get to kiss their child goodnight again. Is, the, is this the moment to reform gun laws? You know, it's, it's easy to go to politics. Banning those weapons that were used in attacks like these. I, I'm certain that, that politics will wave into everything, but right now I'm not focused on the politics of the situation, I'm focused on the families. With so much violence taking place, at the hands of those with severe mental illness. The answer to mass shootings is not fewer guns, but it's more institutional mental health in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all domestic terrorists. But we can do something. There are reasonable steps that we can take as a country to significantly reduce the number of mass shootings. These include for example, stricter gun laws in order to restrict access to firearms. Evidence shows that more thorough background checks, waiting periods, and gun buyback programs are effective in reducing rates of gun violence, including mass shootings. There are other common sense gun laws that might also help, including reinstating the assault weapons ban, banning high capacity magazines or bump stocks, requiring training, insurance, and registration of firearms, or raising the federal age limit for buying firearms. When it comes to extremism, evidence shows that informal interventions by family and friends are one of the most effective ways to interrupt violent radicalization. Of course, that puts a lot of emphasis and responsibility on individuals, but it's important to know where we hold power to make a difference. On a larger scale, de-radicalization will require deconstructing and delegitimizing extremist far-right propaganda, both online and elsewhere. Social media companies have, thus far, evaded government oversight and also taking responsibility for providing a platform for hateful and extremist views. If companies had more of an incentive to moderate their content, 
that might lead to fewer individuals being exposed to hate speech and radical ideology. There are also things that we know won't work. Arming teachers or adding police to schools will only increase the likelihood of gun violence in schools. And there have already been school shootings where all the right things were in place, like locked doors, school resource officers, and a quick and effective response by police, and lots of people still died. Additionally, things like harsh criminal sentences don't really do much to stop mass shooters, since most of them are suicidal and they don't plan to live past the event. What we really need to do is invest in resources and social services that can improve the lives and well-being of Americans. We need a more comprehensive social safety net so people can support themselves and their families without entering into a crisis every time that they lose their job or become involved in the legal system. We need to invest in our schools to help our kids thrive, give them access to mental health services. We need to ensure that people can afford health care. If we can create a society where people's basic needs are met and where they feel like they're part of a community and are connected to other people, we go a long way towards eradicating those hateful, angry, scared thoughts that lead to so many mass shootings. Funnily enough, and this may seem a bit at odds with the point of this video, I think that increasing funding for mental health care might have a beneficial effect. Our country's mental health infrastructure is embarrassingly bad due to the dismantling of psychiatric hospitals and the underfunding of community-based services. I actually talked about both of those things at length in a video about asylums. You can click on the link up there if you want to watch that. Mental illness may not be the motive or cause of most mass shootings, but we do see that most mass shooters experience a life crisis that affects their mental health. If mental health services were better integrated into our communities and were more accessible, that could reduce the stigma of seeking out help. And in turn, it could improve mental health for everyone, not just the seriously mentally ill. I think that we all understand the importance of mental health and the role that it plays in living a satisfying and fulfilled life. And if you watching this video are personally trying to improve your own mental health, then I'd recommend exercising your mind and enhancing your cognitive skills with Brilliant.org. Yeah, it's a bad segue, but hear me out. I wouldn't have been able to do this video justice if I didn't understand statistics. Numbers can easily fool you. And I didn't realize how often I was getting tricked by exciting headlines in the news until I took a stats class in college. But if you've never taken stats, then you need to check out Brilliant. It's the best way to learn math and computer science because they have thousands of lessons on all sorts of topics like AI, neural networks, data science, and a whole lot more. I mean, they've even got a lesson all about retirement. In particular though, I think you should check out their statistics and probability lessons. I wish that I'd had classes like these because they make learning complex topics super fun with their easy and interactive questions. I mean, just look at this lesson on probabilities. Let's make a little jokes about Marvel characters. Anyway, it's a great place to learn new skills or even just to challenge yourself. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash neurotransmissions or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off of Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you for checking them out and thank you to Brilliant for supporting creators like me so that I can make videos like these. So let me repeat again. Mental illness is not a motive for someone to commit a mass shooting. It's pretty clear that the person who pulls the trigger probably isn't living a fulfilled life. But remember that just because we don't understand an evil act doesn't mean that that person is mentally ill. Or even if they are, I mean, that doesn't mean that every action is connected to that diagnosis. Rather than using mental illness as an easy excuse, let's really encourage changes that'll have a substantial impact. For example, I strongly urge you to contact your legislators 
to ask them to enact common sense gun laws. And I look forward to continuing the conversation in the comments below. I really want to hear from you. What do you think? What's going on? What can we do? Thanks so much for watching. And until next time, I'm Micah. Think about it.